My name is uh, Jerry Deutsch, and I'm the past president of the National Health Association. And I'm also the past uh, executive director of the Nutritional Research Foundation. And I've been involved with the NHA since, oh my God, th over 35 or 36 years. And why? It's very simple. My wife and I were having children, and we wanted to have the healthiest children. And unfortunately, back there in 1986, most of what we were being told didn't make sense. For instance, there was no emphasis on diet and general health prior to giving birth, prior to even getting pregnant. That didn't make sense. The whole pregnancy as a medical procedure, childbirth, didn't make sense. Having my wife lie on her back and having a baby pulled out of her just didn't make sense. Being encouraged to feed the baby formula didn't make sense. Buying store-bought baby food didn't make sense. So we were very fortunate and very lucky. I had a very dear friend, uh, someone I'd known, um, a chiropractor, Dr. Siri. And she said, well, why don't you try this organization? They're pretty good. And you know what, while you're, while you're checking them out, they may open your mind about this whole vaccination program. And back then it wasn't too bad. Back then, before 1986, there were just a few vaccines. I guess you uh, probably know that now, I think there are about 72 that are given to kids by the time they're six years of age. Oh, and that's pre uh, the new vaccine, the new COVID vaccine that has now just been approved for children six months of age and older. You know, it's really hard not to get sarcastic about the stupidity um, that's, that seems to abound around true, honest questioning skepticism like really why why i mean it's important to ask the question why and parents that care about their kids really want to know so way back then 35 years ago we found out about what uh, was then called the american natural hygiene society today it's the national health association the nha and in fact I'm talking to you right here from the annual conference. This organization has been around, geez, I've probably been around for about half its life, somewhere around 70, 75 years, and it is a wealth of information. We're going to have over 300 people, incredible speakers, talking about all different aspects of health, not just diet, not just exercise, not just psychology but really how does everything interact with the human organism that we all are? We're, we, we, we've got our physical bodies, but that's not all that there is to it. There's much more to it, but this physical body that we're in really is the home, really is the temple, really is the edifice for which the rest of who we are ex expresses itself. Today, I really, really, really see that there's so much judgment in the world. Like, as I speak to you now about the National Health Association and that I talk about some of these principles of healthy living, it's almost impossible for anybody that's watching this not to have judgments about it. And the problem with judgments is that they come from the ego and there ain't no love coming from the ego. There is no love coming. Love comes from another place and we need to at least I need to, and maybe you need to, explore, judge, you know, those judgments, like examine the judgments and take a look and see how they might get in the way of you expressing your love. I know they've gotten in the way of me expressing my love, especially in this whole era of COVID, such judgments about, so many judgments abound. And what we need is less judgment and more love for this planet. So here at the National Health Association, I'm feeling a lot of love. Just sat down with Frank Sabatino, 
who I've known for over 30 years. And talking about this and, and watching this organization evolve, if you're a little younger than me, get involved with the National Health Association. Now, you said 35 years ago, right? Yep. Now, was it 87, somewhere in there? 86. 86? 80, well, 87, yeah. That's when you basically started taking on a plant-based whole food diet? That's when I learned about the National Health Association, the American Natural Hygiene Society, and that organization is one of the oldest vegan organizations um, in America. Now, did you, were you already plant-based? No, I wasn't. Wh when did you go plant-based? That's when I went plant-based. Oh. Been quite a while. Yeah. So, how did you know it was safe, though? Well, you know, have you, have you ever heard of the Moosewood restaurant up in Ithaca, New York? Well, I was lucky enough to go to college at Cornell, and we had a number of vegetarian, vegan restaurants. And so that's when I started getting interested in that. But I got to say, you know, my parents came from uh, Europe. And in Europe, you know, meat was really a delicacy. They didn't really get a ch have a chance to eat much meat. A lot of the diet was cabbage and onions because they could last all year. So, in fact, that's what I made for dinner for myself and my oldest daughter and cabbage and onions two grandkids yeah cabbage and onions half of half of that's the g a g bomb <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah it's uh and you know it, it, it's a great base for any meal because we can add all your cruciferous vegetables i love to add cauliflower broccoli and anything that's left over you just put in there garlic is good in that as well Sometimes you can make it a little Hawaiian. You can put some pineapple or ginger and a little quinoa with the cabbage and onions, cauliflower, broccoli, kale. Have you made it clear, though, as to how you knew that, hey, I, I can exclude all animal and only eat plants? Like, how did you know that would be the way to go, like, really? Well, you're a little younger than I am. But in the late 60s and the early 70s, vegetarianism was a fad, it was a thing. Really didn't have to wonder about it. There were lots of people that were going veg. I didn't have any concern. And later on I learned that, you know, people make such a big deal about food, but the truth is, what is it? What is food? Fuel. Fuel, energy, gives you fuel, it's energy, and, and nutrients. And there you go. So, did you have any challenges? Is it pretty easy for you? I don't think, I don't think you, you experienced many challenges. You seem like a pretty confident guy. <laughs> I experienced many, many challenges. Okay. And most of them were looking in the mirror. <laughs> I mean, I'd love, I, 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 would, I just don't understand why the whole world doesn't follow the National Health Association guidelines. I don't understand why people are going around like sheep. What are the guy in a nutshell, what are those guidelines? Eat a varied diet of whole plant-based, but healthy plants, you know. We don't want to eat poisonous plants, so that's, you know, you want to eat good, healthy, nutritious plants, fruits, nuts, seeds. You just want to vary your diet. You don't have to be crazy about it. In fact, what you need to do is relax and enjoy your food. And might I say, love the food you have. If you can't have the food you love, love the food you have. Do you ever identify with the word vegan? Um, I did, I did for years. My wife, sorry. Do you ever identify with the word vegan? Or you wanna meet this, my wife? Who is this? <laughs> Come here, cut, have a cut, seat, cut. <laughs> have a seat. We're doing, we're doing a nice video here. I hope it's good, I don't know. How are we doing so far? It's good so far, it's good. Yeah. So, do you ever identify with the word vegan? You've asked me that three times <laughs> now. Um, I did for a while, but I don't anymore, and I'll tell you why. I think one of the things that is really deleterious to human beings are labels. And that's what we have right now in the world today. People are being labeled as this, or that, or this, or that and it just creates division amongst people. And we need less division and more unity. And what creates division? 
judgments, positions, ideology expressed in labels. What brings people together? That four letter word, L-O-V-E. And we just need more love. You got any kind of like tips for helping people maybe get started and you know, it's, it's really challenging because a lot of people are surrounded by people that just don't get this. And my, my, my first tip mm -hmm. is go to the NHA website, nationalhealthassociation.org or anhs.org, American Natural Hygiene Society, which was a precursor of this organization. That's the first thing to do. Just get educated. Like there's so many books. We have magazines, probably 50 years worth of magazines, and most of them you can get on the website for free. It's all, so much of it is for free. So do that. Number two, if you can come to a conference like this, it's a great thing. I've been coming to them for 35 years and some of my best friends, great people that show up here, new people that I meet, who are you? <laughs> Sarah, this is Sarah. Sarah, nice to meet. So like, you know, maybe one day you guys are gonna wanna have some kids. We already have an 18 year old. <laughs> You have an 18-year-old. Yeah. Well, let's not get the interview mixed oh up my. here. <laughs> Whoa. So, so, so did, you, did you explain the... You no, know, you can cut now. Let's <laughs> take a cut. Let's take a cut. I, want... well, well, I, mean, I was going to ask you, like, what are the... the principles. Uh, the principles, yeah. The principles you... of healthy living. Yeah, what are those? Did you go into that enough? Sure, look. And, and, and I don't want to, like, say that there's any... Because at different times of people's lives, at different times... There's different importance, and usually the one that's the most important is the one you're having the most trouble with, or the one that you're the weakest with. So, if you've got the food down, if like you're fine eating a wide variety of vegetables and fruits and beans and legumes and nuts and seeds, then fine, you got that handled. But maybe you're not exercising, maybe you're not moving your body, and like there's not one particular exercise or anything like that. I think the most important thing is to find a way to move your body that's fun. And you know, my, my routine is, I don't, I like to do my exercises, I like to have my exercises for the day, the bare minimum, the base, done before I get out of bed. So I get up in the morning, when I get up, I do my sit-ups right there in bed. Oh wow. So I do my crunches, that's it, I do crunches, and then I do leg lifts. <laughs> and then I do um, all sorts of uh, spinal twists and, you know, I, I, like to, I like to do this to really stretch it out a little bit. And, you know, and, and during the day, you know, just, just do it so that by the time I get to the golf course, I've already, by the time I, I go out to, um, to, to take a hike in the woods, I mean, that's all bonus. Uh, even the food I eat, you know, when I come to a conference like this and it's gourmet, gourmet, vegan, or what we would call nutritarian or healthy vegan food. This is a bonus. I don't eat like this all the time. I eat very simple usually, but this is great to have this. This is really great. And then, let me just keep on <laughs> stretching it out. It's important. The, the part of it that I um, like, because my degrees are in psychology, is the mind. The mind is a very dangerous thing especially if you listen to your own mind. <laughs> It'll tell you all sorts of things that you don't need to hear, that are none of your business. I mean, basically, what your mind tells you about yourself is none of your business. Because it'll go on. Yeah, try and turn it off. You can't turn it off. It's on. Another important thing is some sort of mindfulness. It's really what people are talking about a lot today, is to find a way to calm the mind. Now, whether it's walking in the woods, which really works for me, or laying in bed, you know, doing your exercises. You know, when I, before I get up, I spend like a half hour, 45 minutes. And then I get up and then I can do all sorts of other stretches. But it's also important to sit. To sit, just to sit quietly. And observe the thoughts go cascading through your mind. Because they're always going on, but if we, keep ourselves busy with activity, we don't hear them. We think they're not there, but they're there. So when I get quiet and I just sit and I breathe, I can notice them and I can let them go, just let them go. These are all parts of what we would call a healthy lifestyle. You mentioned psychology and 
you kind of went into that just a little bit. What do you think are some of the reasons why people quit being vegan or plant-based or quit eating healthy and start eating more animals yeah. or go keto or carny or whatever? It's very simple. It stops being fun. You know, I, I, I have to make it fun for myself. So one of the ways I make it fun is I look forward to coming to this conference every year, the National Health Association <laughs> Healthy Living Conference. Healthy living, hello, healthy living. I mean, life is to be lived, to be enjoyed. To, you know, relationships are so important, especially relationships with like-minded folk, people that understand, that can communicate the importance of taking care of yourself and not when you have the ache running to the doctor to get the prescription and then get hooked on drugs the, you know the whole drug yeah well I mean, that could be a whole nother that's a whole conversation why people go to drugs like to fix their minds they go to for drugs duh so they get you know we have we have a huge drug addiction problem you know legal legal drugs yeah, and, and I see, I mean, there's an obvious analogy there, at least, you know, between food and drugs. People that are trying to get treatment, they inevitably almost relapse. And you're going to see that with food well, as well. Well, oh, oh, well, we'll go at it for two different ways. One way is if you're not getting nutrients, you're going to have deficiencies. And you have deficiencies. What we learn, what we want to do is, like, make up for it rather than go back to what the cause is. So that's another key that we're talking about. You know, what are the cause of disease? Look for cause, try and find, you know, cherche the cause. And then if you can find what the cause is, and then fix the cause, and don't go treating symptoms over and over and over again. You know, we're a symptom treating society right now. And you know, it's part of the, the corporatocracy that we live in right now. I mean, but we'll get back to the vegan, I understand. This is about, we want to talk about vegan. Well, I don't think it's really about vegan. I think it's about, you know, just being intelligent about what you eat. And if you want to be 100% vegan, be 100% vegan. If you want to be 90% vegan, be 90%, you know, like, like just really eat as many fruits, that, you know, here we go again. I'll go through, you know, it's your fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, <laughs> legume. Just eat as much of that as possible. Yeah. And, 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 and again, don't judge, you know, and then the whole judgment thing I was talking about before. So one of the problems is people start judging themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a bad person because I had a piece of cheese. Mm -hmm. Hello. And then, well, I guess I, I, I guess I'm just not good enough and I can't make it on this diet, so I might as well give up. I might as well have five pieces. Oh, well, I might as well have a little burger. Oh, you know, and then that, that slippery slope. Because we, we judge ourselves. So I think it's real important not to judge. And what's the opposite of judgment? What did I say before? Love. Love. So love yourself. Love, love yourself just the way you are. Because the truth is, you can't be any other way than you are right now. And as one of my uh, mentors many years ago says, said, said to me, you can't rehearse to be yourself. So I didn't get to rehearse before this. Uh, <laughs> you just grabbed me. I was just sitting there and said, oh, it's time for your interview. So, <laughs> so thank, thank you. you, Jeff, for doing this. This is, this is really great. <laughs> now, you do a lot of work with Furman, right? Oh. I mean, that's where I first met you. You were helping him out with some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've known him for a few years, like 35. <laughs> <laughs> I met Dr. Furman in uh, Long Island. Uh, I don't know if he was uh, officially a, a physician at that time or if he was still doing his intern. I don't know. But it was right at the very beginning of his career. And he had one daughter and I had two daughters. And his daughter was in the middle of my two. So I think they were like three, two, and one. And then Jenna got born after that. So then we had four, three, two. I mean, they were like coming every year, the girls. And we, were, we, we liked uh, the sports. We liked tennis. We liked uh, skiing a lot. So we did a lot of skiing together. And we had the same type of lifestyle as far as the way our, we were feeding our kids and our diet, so uh, we got to spend a lot of time together doing that because 
My family certainly, well, that's not true. I got to say, my mother was a vegan since 1972. Wow, really? Yep, she was. She was a, a, a raw foodist for a while. She spent a lot of time going to, to Hippocrates in Florida. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, yeah, she made a mean cabbage and onions. That's where I learned her from. <laughs> Mom taught me how to make that meal. And uh, I just made it for my kids two nights ago, and they love it too, because she was a wonderful grandmother. Um, she passed a couple years ago, uh, but really beloved. And so she would make, she, and she loved to cook. So she was a great cook before she went vegan. And then when she went vegan in the early 70s, she became a great vegan cook. And we used to love to go over. In fact, she, did she open her? She was going to open a restaurant at one time. I'm glad she didn't. She just. Uh, Do some work with Furman now, like the science he's doing. I was president of the National Health Association at a time uh, when Dr. Furman uh, needed a nonprofit. He had people that wanted to donate money to him to do research. So he asked me and the board of directors if we could somehow have the money donated to the National Health Association and then go to nutritional research. So we did that at the time and it turned out to be extremely successful. We raised a lot of money, in fact, more money for nutritional research than for the National Health Association. So we had to create a foundation. So I found some funders that wanted to support us and create a foundation. They donated the money and the, the attorney fees and, all, and the attorneys so we could create the Nutritional Research Foundation. And then we started having events. We had an event in Aspen, Colorado. I don't know when, probably 10 years, 12 years ago. And Aspen kind of became a center for us to have events every year. We would have dinners, fundraisers, and so I resigned as president of the NHA and Mark came back and, and became president again. He was the president previously as well. And I mean, it was, uh, it was good for me because I'd gotten my job done, which was to take it from near collapse to being somewhat viable again. And then Mark's done a great job of taking it to, to, to where it is right now. And so I work with Joel to create the Nutritional Research Foundation and raise funds to do nutritional research. I'm just talking about you. <laughs> My partner in crime, Mr. Dorch. I was just talking about you. What a great job you've done. We, we go way back, don't we? We really do. We go way back. So. Good to see you here. It's great to be here. So that's what this, con you know, this conference is just great. Connections like that. Again, 35 years. I've got, you know, we're, we're old timers now, but it was so great. 35, we were new. This was... We were in our early 30s, and this was so exciting to really find a philosophy that we could build our health on, and we could have healthy families. And so Dr. Furman, Mark Huberman, Frank Sabatino, Alan Goldhammer, if I've missed anybody, I apologize, but I mean, this was the core, this was the core, and honestly, we're looking for that new core, that new those new young people that are raising families that really get it. And what they really get is the American diet, the American medical system, the American financial system. It's, a lot of it's been corrupted. And we really have to get back to basics. And what are the basics? A vegan, like when I say that, a vegan diet. <laughs> And, uh, and when I say a vegan diet, it, it, there, there's so many ways of, of, of having a, a diet that is based in healthy plants and healthy, I say healthy vegetables, healthy, you know, oh, just a lot of health. And, oh my God, I can go on so many rants right now because to get healthy food, what, what, what do we need? We need people to grow it. And I'm fortunate, I live most of the year in Hawaii and I get to grow a lot of my food there. Nothing like your own avocados, mm, dripping off the trees. And yet, you know, right now, 
the farmland is being, it's being decimated and it's being mechanized. And even the stuff that's being sold as, as organic food, you know, really, the regulators aren't, the, no, I mean, and that gets me into another topic, which is, which is how corrupted and how co-opted and how captured the regulators of this country have become. Whether it's pharma, whether it's environmental, whether it's farm, whether it's food, it's, you know. It's, so the reason why I'm wanting to focus on the re type of research eventually is because I think it would be good to understand that so people really understand what Furman is up to, what you're up to. They think if you sell supplements, then you're up to no good. You Are you rolling I mean? right now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> rolling <laughs> like, like we're on a riverboat, right? <laughs> No, Rolling on the river. You uh, and and so, you see, you're talking about corruption, and, and a lot of people feel like if you sell supplements, then you're probably corrupt. So there's this question about um, DHA mm -hmm. and DHA supplementation, which is one of the things that Dr. Furman recommends. Mm -hmm. Well, but he's not, he's recommending people get tested. Mm -hmm. And if they get tested and they're fine, then he's saying, you don't need to be supplemented. But one of the research studies we did was we took long-term vegans and tested them to see what their DHA levels were and found out that a very high proportion of them were suboptimal. Has that been published yet? Oh yeah, that was published. The question is, what do you do about that? Well, it turned out that we took a look at what they ate and found out that they ate the walnuts and the chia seeds, but they were not able to convert the ALA to DHA. Now, what was it, a food frequency questionnaire or? Yeah, well, there, there, there was a, the questionnaire, and we did this with the University of North Carolina. We had a researcher from the University of North Carolina. And then we then supplemented. We gave these people, they didn't know where it was from, no label on it or anything, DHA. And two months later, all of them, I believe all of them, maybe one or two weren't, but practically all of them, had sufficient levels of DHA. But because it's become political, like people think, no, no supplementation. If you supplement, it's wrong or it's bad or whatever. They take that position and they consider themselves a purists. When was that study done? Ten years ago. And it's never been uh, critiqued uh, negatively. I mean, the study is study. Now, we're, we never claim that we proved anything. What we said is we did this study. And notice how many vegans had suboptimal levels of DHA. Notice we supplemented. Notice they now have optimal levels of DHA. Maybe we should study this a little further. Yeah, because we don't know what that means. Yeah, maybe we should study this a little. We're not saying that everybody should be sub. We're not even saying that this study is th the end all. We're just saying this was preliminary research. I mean, I'm going to get a little political here. It's kind of like Andy Wakefield, who did the study on, you know, kids' guts and kids' microbiomes, and said maybe there's a connection between that and the fact that they were autistic, that he found this correlation. The fact that he even suggested that there was any type of connection to vaccination, which would impact the microbiome of children and autism, they crucified the guy, crucified him, rather than say, oh, maybe we should, and all he said was investigate this further. But if you're not with the orthodoxy of whatever the thought is, the thought system, the Met calls, you know, mass formation. It's mass, you know, when people have a certain belief, that's it. They believe that. So certain vegans believe no supplementation what, you're low on DHA? So what? You know what? That's what your body... Well, Dr. Furman saw lots of patients, a lot of these vegan patients, as they got older, started having cognitive issues. And, again, and he tested their DHA and found that it was below... It wasn't just sub, it was practically zero. Does that prove anything? No. So it would have been nice if the research would have continued on and would have gotten funded and we could have done more research to actually see what the connection is. But the orthodoxy said, no, you're selling supplements. That's why you did the research. Isn't that true? 
Yes, he does sell the supplements, but he didn't do the research to sell supplements. I mean, that's crazy. But that's where people go because of this, what I, you know, what this Belgian psychologist calls, you know, mass formation hypnosis or mass formation um, psychology, which is uh, when a group of people so believe something so strongly, they'll go to whatever end to defend their position. And what I'd like to think is happening here in the NHA, I want to come back to this incredible organization, is that really science is evolving. We have to continually look at the science and be open to it. But honestly, not like some of those idiots that parade on TV that claim they are the science and claim they are following it when they really aren't. I'm just going to put a plug in for another favorite book of mine. It has nothing to do with veganism. It has nothing to do with Dr. Furman. But I think it's one of the best books that's been written about what's happening in the world today. And that's Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s The Real Anthony Fauci. I highly recommend that book. Phenomenal. Phenomenal eye-opening, and yet there's some people that as soon as I mention the name Robert F. Kennedy Jr., like you mentioned the name to some people, Dr. Joel Furman, and they have this, you can't say anything anymore because they already decided that these people are nuts or quacks or idiots or whatever. Yeah, as soon as you mention Fauci, people are like, oh. One way or another, they're going to be. Right. I don't think there's such a thing as a bad person. You know, people are people, and they do all sorts of things. People are mixed uh, as far as their behaviors. And I'm sure that Fauci's done some wonderful things. He's also done some horrendous things. And I think it's important not to take sides that either somebody's horrible or somebody's wonderful, but to actually look at, at the merits. And, you know, most people have mostly good intentions, I believe. Or anything you might want to suggest to people in regard to how they should maybe consider looking at evidence? Yes. Read Alfred Korzybski's book, Science and Sanity. That's my recommendation. Science and Sanity. What's your takeaway from that book? Yeah, uh, who fought in World War I. Uh, he, he was a, a Polish count. And he tried to make sense of, you know, man's inhumanity how inhumane humans were. And what he came up with is something that gets distilled from a, a, a simple expression is, the map is not the territory. And human beings relate to maps as if they were territories. But you can't climb a mountain by climbing a map because the map is simply an abstraction of the territory. So. We are abstractors, human beings. They have these abstractions of things which are not the real things. But we relate to them as if they were the real things. It creates a tremendous amount of confusion. I highly recommend. The book is intense, long. Um, and he founded uh, a whole general study. It's called General Semantics is what he founded, which has nothing to do with semantics but it's called general semantics. And it's really a whole study of language and how the way we use language affects the way we think, which affects our reality, which is affects the way we go in the world. How does that you know, relate to veganism? Well, it relates to veganism is we, you have the word vegan and all of a sudden everybody has a different image, a different idea of what it is and then makes a meaning out of that when, you know, the act of eating a healthy diet is just that. And any description of it is not that. I'm not making sense if you can follow that. It's just a description of what it is. And then we get into the word battles of the des people's descriptions of what they think, and they're not even talking about the same thing. So what I recommend people do is read, like really study. There's diverse thoughts and thinking in many different subjects. Be limitless. Allow yourself to be wrong. Allow yourself to question. You know, and you doubt something, doubt your doubt about that. And come to a conference like this, the National Health Association, where we have 
you know, a dozen or so presenters and dozens of other people that are on this exploration and have conversations, open conversations, understanding that the conversation is not the reality. The conversation is a way of getting to it. Like this great musician, uh, Jack Johnson, you know, like all poets, what they do is they use that vehicle to point to reality. Sometimes a poem will be more, more real, even though it's abstract, than somebody that's actually describing something. Because they can only see it from one viewpoint. There's a totality, and we can only see a certain percentage of it. We get distance, we can see more of it. Get even more distance and you can see more, but you can't see it all as precisely. And the problem is, if you stay real close and get myoptic, you only see one thing, you don't believe there's the other side. And there's always another side. Whatever the position is, there's always the other side. And there's always evidence for the other side. And there's always reality there. How do you stay positive in, in such a sick world? You know, the world is the world. And the, I have no control over anybody but myself. So the world can do what it wants. It will do what it wants, no matter what I think. I have control of how I relate to it. So I can relate to it and interact with it as I choose. That's the power that I have. And that's the power I believe everybody has. The question is, what's, the mo what's their motivation? You know, most people, the only motivation they have is to get along, is to make it. Or they have some idea of what success is to be. I, I was very fortunate. I think everybody's fortunate, but you know, I see myself as fortunate because I had wonderful parents. I have wonderful set, I have wonderful children, I've got great, wonderful grandchildren, you know. Just, my life is filled with, with beauty, but I could easily choose to see it as not beauty. I could choose to see it as horrific. I could turn everything around. It's the perspective that I take. So I chose 35 years ago to follow this path of health, of healthy living. I chose that. And I've gotten, you know, great benefits from it. Or I could, you know, flip it around and talk about, God, I could have made so much more money had I, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's so many other paths. And so I really believe it's a question of perspective. And you've surrounded yourself with positive, healthy people, too. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Take any position and all the naysayers show up. Commit to anything and what shows up, the first thing you commit, resistance. Oh, they still think I'm a nut. Are you kidding me? Have you ever been like assaulted or attacked in any kind of verbally or physically, or just in any way, shape or form because of the fact that you're different? Have I been verbally attacked? I'm gonna really, I mean, be straight with you. The polarity that exists now due to this um, mandates that are being, where we're, uh, sanity is starting to come back again. But the insanity, the insanity of these COVID injection mandates has created very intelligent people in my life. People that I knew for years, graduates of Ivy League colleges, law, whatever, go completely off the wall at the mere questioning of what was happening in this country. Because they felt that if you at all question, if you, like let's take something simple, like natural immunity. Like most doctors, most scientists will say, of course there's such a thing as natural immunity. It's been around for the longest time. But if you were to say that it was possible to have natural immunity, to acquire natural immunity to COVID, oh, like, it did not, because then you were part of the other side. When you said that, you were against Biden, which meant you were for Trump. How do they make this stuff up? Craziness, it's insanity. So I listened to that and I said, you know, I get it. You really think that when I tell you that natural immunity is a wonderful way to deal with COVID, 
and most people acquire it without any problems at all, that I am now supporting Trump. And, and this is, and I, I'm not talking about stupid people. Mass <laughs> formation hypnosis or mass formation, whatever word you want to put at the end. Well, I wanted to look up the name of the guy who wrote the book on that. He's brilliant. You see this scratch right here? Yeah. You don't see it, maybe. See it, see it. A okay. little bit. Well, I mean, I a little see bit. So I was in my house. I'm, I'm, like, I'm trying to fix my house up. My daughter, who is 19, anyway, her room was a mess, and I was trying to clean it up while she was in Hawaii with her mom. And so there was a nail hanging where it shouldn't have been, and so I scratched myself. So you know what? I put antibiotic on it. I put antibiotic cream on it. Now, I have some friends that think that that's a horrible thing to do. And they have a right to think that. You know, I, I, I think there's an appropriate time for antibiotics. Like when I get scratched by a nail. Now, did I get a tetanus shot for this? No. Because most people have no idea where tetanus comes from. Like, no, I don't have a horse. No, the horse didn't poop in my daughter's room. No, I didn't rub this. No, it didn't heal over there anaerobically. No, there wasn't a chance of tetanus. But if I were at a farm, I don't know. If I had a nail and it was sitting in horse poop and I was unconscious for two days and couldn't clean it out, I, I don't know. I guess there'd be, you know, time to get tetanus shot. We live in a toxic world. Yeah, yeah. The idea is to limit our exposure to toxins and create our immune system, which is designed to eliminate toxins. There's the carcinogens all over. Most of them, our body can take care of very easily, especially if it's in good shape. That's my opinion, you know what? Well, how do I know? I mean, look, that's just, that's just my belief. How do I know? You know, this whole thing about people knowing stuff. What, what about like like these people that are going on these carnivore or keto or paleo diets? Like, do you have any like thoughts on that? Like, yeah. do, you ever, do you ever feel like maybe, man, what what if I'm missing out on something that they're that they're? No, if I ever thought that, I'd have a piece of meat. Yeah. Do you think it's important for other be people to be plant based or vegan? I think people should do what they want to do. They should. Have, I, I really believe in freedom of informed choice. That's really bottom line. What it comes down to freedom of informed choice. Now, I, I have a problem with that because when you're born and raised, like it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier um, about the group thought thing. When you're brought up in a culture where it's, it's doing something that's toxic and you're brought up to, you know, essentially think that this is normal and this is what you should be doing and you're conditioned to this and desensitized to it and all of these things, you're not really making a choice. You're just doing that. You're a kid, you, you believe in your parents, you trust in your parents. Yeah. You, you know, you, you, you think they're all knowing or whatever, you know, to some extent, at some point, you know, you're gonna trust in them and think this is right. So mm -hmm. you're not gonna say, oh, well, even though I'm like a kid, I'm gonna do something completely different. All I can say is I wish the camera were on you right now so that people could see the way you're moving your body, <laughs> the way you're jumping around. <laughs> your gestures are, are excellent. Listen, it's quite clear. One of my mentors, uh, the great Albert Ellis, a great psychologist said, we all have messed up parents. There are no such thing as perfect parents. We're, we're all screwed up. As a parent, what you try and do is not screw your kid up too much. But sorry, there's no parent that hasn't screwed his kid up in some way or her kid up in some way. That's part of this human experience that we have. And then you get to a point where you get to evaluate and you get to take a look at your life and you make choices. You can choose to go along with it you can choose to come to the NHA conference and, and meet the wonderful people that are here and eat the wonderful food that's here and listen to the wonderful lectures and hear this perspective. But think about it. I think, now, are you saying people should do whatever they want? It's not important for others to go plant-based because they should do what they want because you want them to make the decision on their own. 
essentially. You don't want to be judgmental. You want to love. You don't want to be... Is that what... You, is that what you, you, it sounds like you're being a little judgmental here. Well, I'm just trying to understand. Because, because, oh, so let me explain it yeah. as best I can. Yeah. As best I can. People are going to do what they're going to do. Your opinion about what they do is your opinion. It's really as simple as that. So people are eating a barbecue right over. All the value of that comes from you, your judgments about them. And honestly, the stronger your judgments against that, in my opinion, the stronger it will perpetuate that behavior. Because people tend to resist and they don't like to be told that they're wrong. And resistance, opposition. Here, watch, just try this right here. Mm -hmm. You're really wrong about that. See, that doesn't, now try this. You're right. You're right. Which, which feels better? Yeah, exactly. I wish that camera was on you just so we could see the, the look on your face. But, you know, but at some point we need to draw a line, obviously. Like we got to say, we got to say, at some point we got to draw a line. Like, right, like, like, like if it's, if something is invasive, right? I don't, I, I don't have to like it. Yeah, yeah. It's, I don't have to approve of it, but I don't have to disapprove of it either. And I'm not saying anything goes and anything's okay, but really anything goes and anything's okay. <laughs> you know, there's so many different levels of reality. At one level, none of this matters. As uh, Baba Ramdas said, it's all grist for the mill. Now he didn't say it's all pork for the chops. I mean, he said it's all grist for the mill. In the Jewish tradition, they read the Torah every Saturday. And the Torah is supposedly the word of God that Moses brought down. And they have these portions. And part of the story of, 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 uh, of Exodus is that the Jewish people left Egypt and, and they didn't have any meat to eat. And they complained to God, why don't we have meat? Now God had provided them, according to the story, this manna. You know, you've heard manna from heaven. And they got all the food, all this great food to sustain them. But what did they do? They complained they didn't have meat. And that really pissed God off. So the walk in the desert was supposedly three days. They complained it was three days. They said, I don't want to walk that much. So God said, fine, I'll make it so you can do it in a day. And you know what they did? They complained. They said, I don't want to have to walk so fast. And then they complained about not having enough meat. Like if people would just cut down their consumption of animal products by 50%, what a huge difference that would make. Now we can look at that again from the perspective of what? They're still eating 50% of the meat they were eating? That's horrible. Or we could say, wow, isn't that amazing? We're going in the right direction. Let's encourage that. Let's bless them. Let's, let's praise them for what they've done. Has ethics become part of this journey for you? What do you mean by ethics? Like, like, okay, so vegan typically has three pillars. They say the health, the environment, and then the ethics. Well, you know, years ago, years ago, I guess about 10 years ago, when I was really, ex I mean, I wouldn't touch leather. I mean, I was very, very, very strict. Um, but basically, I was doing it for health reasons. I chose to eat a healthy plant-based diet uh, because I wanted to be healthy. And I had some vegans tell me I was vegan for the wrong reasons. That's part of what Korsipsky, Korsipsky would say is unsane and that we live in an un, unsane world. Because, you know, sane person would say that's, that's great. Even though you're not doing it for the animals. But the truth is I love animals. And I love plants. Oh, I, I mean, I grew my first onion this year. Do you ever grow an onion? 
The onion flower is so beautiful, and yet most people never ever get to see an onion flower. So this year I got to see an onion, a, couple, a couple of onion flowers. You know why a cruciferous is a, called a cruciferous, right? Why is cruciferous called cruciferous? Because the flower looks like a crucifix. Oh, come on now. I'm serious. Come on now. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Where'd you get that from? It's just what it is. No, you made that up. <laughs> or somebody made that up. It's kind of cool, but. Yeah, just to get this out. So it sounds like you're predominantly, mostly health oriented. With the ethics is, eh, not so No, I, no, that's not true at all. I think we should really. Do you know anything on this planet that's living that is not gonna die? Do you, can you tell me one thing that's not gonna die? I, I can tell you there's nothing out there that's going to die from me. Like, really? directly. Directly. Really? Directly. Oh, direct, but indirect. That's absolutely oh, going to die oh, from So me. indirect is okay, but direct isn't. Well, something. How about all the human beings in this, on this planet? How, how about the suffering, the, the lack of food, the, the persecution of human beings on this planet? How about them? Now, plants are about 17 times more productive than eating animals. So we could easily feed 20-fold more people, probably. So why do you want more people? No, it's not more people. Uh, we could okay. feed 24 more people. So a billion people starving every, every year annually. Oh, you know. and you think that's because there's not enough food? Well, it's another, another crazy conception. You know why people are hungry? Because of a lack of compassion for human beings. Okay. So let's work on point. that. That's a good point. So now where, now at well, now, you're get, now you're getting me really going here. Now, yeah, but, but if you think about it, where does that compassion come from? Now, if we, if we desensitize people from childhood to say, okay, it's okay to discriminate. This animal you can kill, eat. This one you can't. Like, are, are, we're teaching them discrimination from one life to another. We're, no, no, we're not. We're teaching them exactly what you said. It's okay to kill this animal. It's not okay to kill that animal. That's what we're teaching them. Yeah, but that's teaching them violence. I tell you. Isn't it? I mean, it, I don't know. There ain't no perfect parent. <laughs> you got screwed up by your parents, and maybe it wasn't because they told you that it was okay to kill this animal and not that animal, but you were screwed up by your parents. The thing is, now you can't live in the past. It's like in this moment, make the healthy choice this moment. What's happened in the past, it's happened in the past. You only have one choice of what you can do with that, is how you look at it, is how you judge it, and how you judge yourself, and how you judge others, and how you judge those parents. Stop! I mean, it just seems logical. Maybe it's wrong to think this way, but that, that a person who sees animals as something they don't want to hurt, that, that, that would extend over into other aspects of life. Like, I don't want to hurt animals, I don't want to hurt anything, I don't want to hurt a person, I don't, you know. Whereas somebody's like, okay, it's, hurt, it's okay to kill an animal and eat it. That, that might make that person more violent. You don't think that person would be generous, that would carry over into other aspects of life? I don't know, I don't know, but I gotta tell you, the person that you really have to be kind to is yourself. Yeah, yeah. And when people have gotta do that one first, compassion for self which leads into the most important thing I could possibly say here love is the answer but forgiveness is the way and forgiveness starts with forgiving oneself and forgiving one's parents I like uh, I, I like that too because it, you know I think you have to love yourself before you can love others I think you have to love yourself before you can stop being a violent human being. Because I believe all aggression is projection. And I believe the anger lives within. And it's the expression of that projected onto others. Do you think we'll ever have a, a plant-based or a vegan world? You are such an optimist. I love your optimism. What's going to happen to this world? 
It's the grandchildren that I'm concerned about. It's the grandchildren that are involved in this huge experiment. It's a yeah. huge experiment. This, um, this game of power and domination and control and wealth and a lot going on in this world. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. What, it just seems to me life is like light, you know, particle and wave. And so we're in this wave. And it goes up and it goes down. And whether the world will continue to exist and how it will exist is as considering that is as futile as considering, uh, you know, the poor kid whose parents didn't tell him the difference between which animals to kill and which animal, or told him there was a difference between the two of it. Because it's only right now that we can act and we can be the best, most compassionate, loving human beings we can be right now. And anything that takes us away from that distraction takes us away from the present moment or from what Albert Korzybski would say is reality. Reality, we can't speak it. Anything we say about reality is not reality because it's a description of it. The true events that are happening are indescribable. I think this kind of goes back to what you said maybe in the beginning of this when you mentioned mindfulness because I feel like that's what you're hitting on here over and over. Well, again, I don't know what mindfulness is, but I can tell you what comes up for me. And for me, mindfulness is, is care and concern for myself and for others. And when I say others, I'm talking about animals, I'm talking about children, I'm, I'm talking about all of that. So mindfulness is seeing the difference between what some people would call your ego, your thoughts, your mind, and who you really are. And who you really are is worth exploring. And mindfulness, to my way of thinking, is that research, that self-inquiry into who you really are. And when you think that who you really are, and then you put a label on it, I'm just going to say, by definition, that's not who you are. I, just, I, like, I like the word vegan because it, 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 it describes my behavior. Well, if you want to be confined and dominated by that word, it's, your, it's a free world. It's your choice. Do you ever feel encouraged, like, like it's good to encourage others? And, and do you do that? I do that all the time. How do you go about it? I share my experience with the National Health Association. I, I share what I hear here and what I learn here. I share books that I have, articles, videos. I share that with people that want to hear it. But first I ask them if they want to hear it. Most vegans that I know don't. <laughs> they, they don't ask. They don't question. Did you raise your kids vegan? I can't remember. Yes. Oh, wow. How old are they? My oldest is 36. Wow, cool. And, my, and she has a son that's five, and a daughter, my granddaughter's three. And then my next one is 34, and she has a one-year-old who is just so cute. And they're all being raised vegan? Um, no, they're not being raised vegan. They're being raised, what I would say, mostly vegan. So they're vegan and their kids aren't? Your grandkids aren't? My kids, well, they were, we raised them as vegan, but, you know, they're kids. They make their own choices. Oh, okay. So for the most, they, they don't eat any meat. They don't eat, uh, they, they don't eat meat or fish. But I do think they're ve more vegetarian. I think they do have some eggs, and I think they do have some, some dairy products. Now, I could be really pissed off about that, you know. <laughs> I could get very, like... Or I could say, isn't that great? Yeah. Isn't that great, you know, how well they're doing? Because most kids kind of like uh, <laughs> get into opposition with their parents. <laughs> Democrats have Republicans. Uh, kind of an interesting phenomena that happens in the world. So do you have any success stories you might well like to share? 
like where you've either either you're a part of it or you just observe somebody else like that well, that's well, I'll tell you one of my greatest success stories is a man by the name of Mark Huberman who is now the president of the National Health Association and is doing such a phenomenal job you know I wish all of you could be here at the conference it's being live streamed this year and it'll be live streamed next year so maybe there'll even be a great promotion right after this conference to get this conference and next year at a very great uh, early price. Who knows? But um, I don't believe that there is a truth in the world. I believe that there are pointers to the truth. And this organization, for me, is the greatest pointer and direction towards finding whatever that truth is. And I think it's very, very important when you ask about mindfulness. That's what mindfulness is is doing that self-discovery, that exploration to go deep within and see what resonates. What is, what is true for you? I don't know. I don't know how many more trips I'm going to have on this planet. This might be the last trip I have. So what choice? I, I can choose to make the most of it. Or I could choose to complain. Or I could have a little bit of both. <laughs> Do you have any, uh, anything that we didn't go over that you might want to share um, that or a last minute encouraging words. So many wise people have said so many wise things. Be true to thine own self. You know, march to the beat of your own drum. Uh, keep an open mind. Like, um, do the work. But have fun doing it. Because if it's not fun, maybe there's some other work to do. Any quotes you want to share? Yeah, I just want to say that if it's difficult for you to be a vegan, then maybe you should consider finding ways to have fun being a vegan. And one of the fun ways to be a vegan is to come to NHA conferences and hang out with people here and have fun and the camaraderie is great. And I wouldn't want to be any other place than right here, right now. You have a favorite quote? Yes. Mark, you're going to have to help me with this one, though. Um, let the truth be known, even if the heavens fall. Let there be truth, though the heavens may fall. Herbert Shelton, the founder of this great organization, one of the founders.